We see that David went from a shepherd to a warrior, from a warrior to a worshiper, back to a warrior, and then as a King David, but he never stopped being a son. Last week was an amazing, amazing experience. I don't know if any of you all were there last week. If you were not here, make sure you check out YouTube, podcasts, all the channels to look it up. That experience was amazing. Pastor Justin talked about saying goodbye to insecurity. Not just a regular goodbye, but it was like an in sync. Bye, 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 bye. I mean, like we're serious about our goodbyes around here. And the message was so good during that experience. He talked about how insecurity is literally demonic and rooted in almost every sin. And why is that? Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound. All right. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all. All right, that was your report card, Pastor Justin. Good job. I'll report back that you're teaching the word. Amen. All right, so we're writing letters to our exes. And last experience, last week, we talked about saying goodbye to insecurity. This week, we're saying goodbye to identity issues. Amen. What does it mean to be have identity issues, to have be an identity crisis? It means uh, identity issue refers to a period of uncertainty or confusion in which a person's sense of self or personal values or beliefs are in conflict or questioned, um, where they begin to question their role, their purpose, their goals, their relationships, their overall sense of purpose. Will anybody admit that they've been there before? I know I have. I have been there before. I've been in identity issues. I've been in identity crisis. And this week, during this experience, we're going to be saying goodbye to identity issues. We saw where the GPS of insecurity led King Saul. Like it rerouted, rerouted, rerouted him right out of the will of God. He was appointed, and then later he was a disappointment. Y'all don't know. So the, the message was so good last week that this is part two. This is part two to Pastor Justin's message last week, and we'll be coming from 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3. 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 3. I'll be reading through the New King James. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Feel your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If, I, if Saul hears of it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you. That's an animal, not a female. And say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you title of today's message is the one God names the one God names let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you so much for your word we thank you father that your spirit will sit in the midst of us today that we will be not just hearers of your word but doers of your word I thank you father that we can't see where we end and your world word begins because we're one engraft in us your word engraft in us your commandments engraft in us your ways oh God so that we can walk in it so that we can live it Lord God and that we can pass it down and it'll be present in our legacy so father we thank you father that as we let go of what was and take hold of what is Lord God that we will walk in power In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. You can have a seat today. I will never forget being 21 years old. I was infatuated with the stock market. Infatuated with the stock market. I know there's a lot of young people here, and so you guys have probably never heard of this movie, but it's called Trading uh, Places, and um, it was starring Eddie Murphy. And what they did was they did an experiment, and they took a homeless guy who was Eddie Murphy off the street, and they said, look, we're going to dress you up, we're going to fix you up, and we're going to say that you're a stockbroker, like you're a famous stockbroker, and we're going to see what happens. We're going to see how bad you fail. But Eddie Murphy did a switcheroo, and he did actually really good. But in that movie, they showed the New York Stock Exchange, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and I was infatuated. I was set. I was like, I will work 
on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Like, that is what I'm doing. That's where I'm going. And so what I did on my way there, I decided to start researching. We're from Cali, so I look up in San Francisco. Where's the best investment firm to work? That's where I want to work. I found the place. I went through a series of interviews. I mean, interview after interview, leaders, leadership after leadership to go to and work at this important, prestigious investment firm. And I got to the last interview, well, I thought it was the last interview, with the CEO. I'll never forget sitting down with Phil when Phil was super calm and collected. He was the founder. This dude was just, he was everything. And so I'm like, I gotta make a great impression. This is the one. This is it. So I sat in front of him and I'm talking about, he says, so tell me about yourself. Who are you? Well, listen, I'm good in Excel spreadsheets. I can do this. I went to this school. I did this. I do this. Listen, if you bring me to your firm, this is what I can do for your firm. Your firm will be better because of me. And I'm thinking, sold. All I'm waiting for now is you're hired. So I was watching his lips, and it was like a, I was like, say it, you're hot, you're hot, say it. And he said, you know what I want to do? There's one more interview I want you to have. And I'm like, I must not did a good job. I must not have impressed him. He says, we're having a summer party in two weeks. I want you to come to that summer party because at that summer party is every client we have. Now, all their clients were hedge funds uh, managers, hedge fund brokers. And you guys don't, probably may not know what that is, but they basically take, that, take care of millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, they only work with accredited investors, which means that's people with a lot of money that, have, that can loosely just lose $10 million if they need it to. So in order to qualify as an accredited investor, you have to have a lot of money for the government to say, okay, go ahead. You can invest tens of millions of dollars without we knowing it or wreck you. So all these clients were going to be at this summer party. And he said, I want you to come to this summer party because I want to see what my clients think of you. I want to see all what all the other employees will think of you. So I want you to come to this summer party. Oh man, okay, so I show up at the summer party. It's at a mansion. Here I am. I brought my blanket because as far as what I know about a summer party, we land out blankets. We having picnics. No, I show up. It's at a mansion. People walking around with trays of, of, of caviar and flutes of champagne. So I, st I stashed my blanket in the bush <laughs> after I got out of valet. I stuffed it in the bush, and I walked out like, yeah, it's fine. I belong here. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So now I'm talking myself up. I'm like, okay, Kaya, you got to go impress the right people. Look for them. Come on. I'm like, come on, Holy Spirit. Who do I need to impress? Show them to me. There we go. So I see a group of guys, about six guys, they're standing in a circle. They get their hands are in their pocket. I'm like, they seem cool. I want to go to the cool people. I bet you they're in charge. I bet you they're probably the most important client. So I'll walk up to them like, hi, I'm Kaya. And so they all kind of look like, okay, so what? I said, listen, I want to tell you something. I'm going to be starting soon. So you better remember my face because I'm going to start at your firm. And you know what? The firm's going to be better because I'm here. I, I, look, I, I, I know how to do this. I went to this school. I did this. I did this. And they're looking like, they're kind of looking at each other every once in a while. And they nod like, so what? And I was like, I just don't understand why I didn't impress these guys. So I walked away deflated because they were kind of like, so what? Get out of our circle. So there I was going back, and I was kind of thinking about going to grab my blanket out that bush and headed back to valet because I was thinking, maybe this isn't it. And you know what? May I I'm kind of glad that he sent me to this summer party so I can really see I don't fit. Actually, you know what? I don't really. Wh what makes me think I'm good enough to even work here? They're the most prestigious firm in San Francisco. Why would I think that I'm good enough to work here? And right in the midst, or in right smack dab in the middle of that thought, I looked, I turned to the right, and there was those six guys walking up on the stage and grabbing their instruments. Oh, they're the band. They're the band. They were just here to entertain the people, not for me to entertain or win them over. Wow. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship that you've given it all you got and it didn't work out and you're trying to figure out what podcast did I not listen to what book did I not read what thing did I not do what dish did I not cook that it didn't work out oh it was just the entertainment I don't know if you've been at a job and you've given it all you got. You've literally been, you know, bent over backwards, did other people's work, and it still didn't work out. And you're thinking, what did I not do? Did I not show up in the right energy? Did I not say the right things? Like, what was it? And you find out, oh, that was just the entertainment. 
That was not for me to entertain them. And we see Samuel dejected and mourning because he spent half his time talking and entertaining and leading and trying to teach the entertainment. Oh, King Saul was not it. He was just there to to grab applause of the people. He was just the entertainment. Yet here we see Samuel mourning somebody that's still alive. God says, stop mourning for King Saul. It's time to get up and grab the horn. Ooh, when you tell a prophet it's time to grab the horn, it's like telling the Blues Brothers, grab the Cadillac. We're putting the band back together. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't know what that means. None of y'all know what that means. God said to Samuel, grab the horn. I'm on the move again, which means it's time to anoint somebody again. I have not quit. I'm not dead. I'm not done. We're moving. Grab the horn. Let's go. Dust it off. Samuel was mourning because he thought, what did I not do right? with King Saul. He's sifting through thoughts of rejection. He was the prophet. He was a leader among the nation, which means God's given me a message to pass down to King Saul. What did I not do right? Because this guy was appointed and later a disappointment. And I don't know if any of you have been in that situation before. But I've been a pastor for 15 years now, and there's been many times I've mourned the losses of God's people that's been under my care, that's been under my leadership. I've mourned the losses of my children. I've mourned the losses that's been, that it's happened in my family because I'm thinking, what did I not do right? I'm sifting through thoughts of failure. What podcast did I not listen to? What book did I not read? Because what happened is my responsibility and my call does, is not my identity. But somewhere along the line, it seeped into the cracks of my insecurity and began to chip away at my identity. So when the, the stock market goes down, so does my value and my identity. And Samuel was mourning, not just for King Saul, but he was mourning his part. Lord, did I let you down? Woo. The call, the profession, the work, the responsibility, and the outcome is not my identity. You know why? Because things come and things go. Guess what, y'all? Some marriages came and some marriages went. Children come, we raise them up, and guess what? We train them up in the way that they shall go. So, What happens to your identity when you take on the responsibility, the call, and the profession as your identity? Does it go to? No. Identity, our identity is we are a child of God. Our identity is found in sonship. And sonship is where we build everything else in our life. Our marriages, our ministry, our work, our responsibility, our call is all built on top of our identity, which is sonship. Identity is found in Christ alone. Samuel's call and his responsibility, his part to play, just like many of us, it it crept into sacred sacred places and chipped away at his value, his purpose, and his worth, and it left him mourning. Why? Because King Saul was a king anointed by the people. He was, he was their American idol. He was people's, the people's choice. Remember, he stood head and shoulders above the people. But God says, now I will anoint for me a king. God's choice. God was ready to anoint a king for himself. And we must be careful about what we desire and what vision we have. Because now we see God literally allowed the people's vision to be made manifest and we see where it got them. We got to be careful about what kind of pastor we want, what kind of church we want, what our family needs to look like. We got to be careful about our vision because sometimes our vision accidentally supersedes God's vision. It says in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be aside, and turn aside to fables. Be careful what you ask for. God just might allow you to have it. Do you know that the Jewish people are still waiting on the Messiah? Because Jesus didn't come fitting their vision. We got to be careful about our vision, y'all. If our vision isn't in line with God's vision, it's division. 
and it will divide us and reroute us. It'll be our GPS and reroute us right out of the will of God. Amen. But in verse two, God said, I've provided for myself, which means don't worry about it. I provided it for myself. There's a lot in that. God says, I provided for myself, which means there's something that God placed from himself into another person to provide for himself a king. And we know who who he's talking about. He's talking about King David, who's known after a man after God's own. Yes, you guys know the word. I love you guys. King David was a man after God's own heart. How do we know? Do we know where King David started? He started as a lowly shepherd, a lowly shepherd boy, shepherding his father's sheep. They weren't even his sheep. He's out in the field being obedient to where his father placed him, where his father told him to be. There was nothing impressive about him. There was nothing great about him. He didn't stand head over shoulders over nobody. But God says, I've provided for myself. You know, I believe that when God provided it for himself, he provided it in the midnight hour when when David probably felt abandoned, when David probably felt cast off, when David probably felt less than, and it's just him and the sheep. And God says, I'm providing for myself in those moments with King David. 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 9, it says this. This is what God's telling Samuel to tell King David. Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I look you, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have cut off your enemies from you before, before you. And I have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. This was God's message to King David. God saw David as the son in the shepherd. He saw him operating in obedience in sonship with his father's sheep even to a point when king Sol- when solomon um samuel came to uh jesse and said hey bring me all your sons jesse forgot about david why because he was just over there being obedient he was where jesse left him in this in the field with the sheep but he was so used to his faithfulness. He was so used to him being um, a, 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 a faithful and obedient son. He literally forgot about him. So we see King David going from a shepherd to one who worshiped in the pitch black of night. Not smelling the best, not looking the best, but just being obedient to his father. Amen. They weren't even his sheep. But David manned his post at the, as the shepherd of the sheep, whereas the, his father told him to do. So in the place of obedience, though it might not be comfortable, and even we even might suspect that sometimes um, we may have been uh, forgotten about, but God is doing something in your current season to the point where that you're not moving from that season until that season moves in you. I hope somebody catch this today. I hope somebody catch this today because we see that David went from a shepherd to a warrior, from a warrior to a worshiper back to a warrior, and then king as a King David. But he never stopped being a son, an obedient son. So no matter what King David was called to do, no matter what he did, he was always remained a son. And for some of us, this is what we need to see today, that God is about establishing a kingdom and kingdom access, not just to us, but through us and through sonship. When we become the one God names, not because we earned it, but because we decided to stay faithful to our God given identity. You know how we pray the prayer? Father, let your kingdom come and let your will be done. We're calling, talking about us. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. When the people of God stand in their real identity, the kingdom begins to come upon the earth and his will is done. Why? Because it's carried in the hearts and on the backs and the minds and in the family and in the legacy of God's people. Your kingdom come, your will be done in us, through us, on the earth. Amen? Romans 8 and 19, it says this, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. All of the earth is standing in anticipation for the sons and the daughters of God to show themselves faithful in true identity, not being the entertainment, 
not being what the world wants you to be, not carrying the labels of, of your past, not carrying the labels of your mom and your dad and your grandfather and your grandmother, but carrying the label of the almighty God. God says, I provided for myself, for the people I have named, that my kingdom may come upon the earth that my will will be done in and through him, that they begin to change atmospheres because the kingdom of God is showing up in places all over the world. May the public callings of your life never change the sonship that God called over you in the dark place. May every opportunity that, the opportunity that you have not become your label, but that your label will always remain the same. I am a daughter and a, and a son of God. I don't care whether I'm in the stock market or I'm standing on a pulpit. I am a daughter and a son of God. God says, with that, I've provided for myself those who I have named. God uses the valley moments to feed us. Do you know a shepherd never leads the sheep to the mountaintop? Only goats like to hang out on the mountaintop. Mountaintops are for selfies and then get back down to the valley. The shepherd leads us through the valley. Why? Because everything that we need, all the nutrients, is in the valley. Nothing grows on the mountaintop. The mountaintop is like, hey, all right, I'm back, back onto it. I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. God will give you a mountaintop moment. Breathe, get back down. The shepherd's saying, let's go. We got more valley, more valley, more valley to cover. I hope you guys catch it. The shepherd's saying, let's go. There's more things to do in the valley. There's more that the kingdom needs to be moving in the valley. The kingdom needs to show up in the valley when you show up as your authentic self. Not what your mom said that you ought to be. Not what your dad said that you ought to be. But when you stand up for the name that God has called you. God says, I provided for myself in the valley. I provided for myself in the valley through Legacy Church. That thy kingdom is coming in the valley. Don't get too comfortable on the mountaintop. We were called to the valley. Do you know that Jesus lived as a son? Obedient son all through the, through the Bible. We hear, him, we hear him saying, my father, my father, my father, my father. If you've seen me, you've seen the father, the father, the father. Why? Because he moved and he operated it in obedience. My father, in my father's house, there is many mansions. If it was not so, I would not. He, we see him moving and operating as a son and then as a shepherd. As he led the disciples, as he taught them, as he led about the way through the valley. This is where you eat from. This is where you grow from. This is how you shake this off. If they reject you, shake the dust off your feet. We see him as a shepherd with the disciples. And then we see him as a warrior. When he got up on the third day. Woo! When he got up. <laughs> when he got up, we saw him as a warrior. Defeating death. Putting death in its rightful place. And then now we behold him as king. But he never stopped being the son, the obedient son of God. His identity was always what his father said he was. And that's for us today. That God moves us from sonship, not away from it, but in sonship. As we are carriers of our God's vision and presence. Romans 8, 14 through 17, it says this. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, oh these, oh those... Yeah, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear or insecurity or identity issues, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified in him and with him in sonship. If I can have the band come up as I close out. Listen, God has made a way for us out of the worldly labels. People say it all the time, Pastor Kaya, please pray for me. I, I, think, I, I think I got demons chasing me and messing with me. and I'm confused. I just, I don't know who I'm supposed to be. I just, I feel like I don't know my purpose and I'm just, I'm struggling with my worth and my value. I just, Pastor Kaya, please, I need you to pray for me. And a lot of times, it's not the demons that we need to be set free from. It's, sometimes it's the labels, even from our family members. Some of you guys have family members that like, we're the Joneses. We have nice cars. We have nice houses. That's who we are. Somebody's like, well, we have the, we're the Richardsons. This is what we do. We're all doctors. If you're not a doctor, you're not what you, you know you can do. This is what, don't mess up our family name. 
No, it ain't demons. It's other people's labels that they've given us. But I don't want the label of the world. I want the label of God because God says, I'm going to provide for myself. Daddy's not going to provide it. Mom's not going to provide it. Everybody else that I'm comparing myself to will not provide it. I only want to be named by him who can not just name me, but keep me no matter where I go. Keep me in every situation, whether I'm married or divorced, whether I'm single or I'm not, whether I'm childless or with children. I want him to keep me in every season. But if I'm not named by him, how can I be kept by him? God keeps his, those who, who he names. God says he looks after his word to perform it. Well, God, I hope I'm looking like your word today. Because you're not going to reject me. When I go out, you're going to send me out and I'm going to accomplish what you sent me to do. Why? Because I'm a carrier of God's word. He's named me. He's commissioned me. He's given me the authority to walk into atmospheres. And it begins to change. I'm not afraid of the dark because the dark runs when I show up because I'm carrying the light. That's what happens when we walk in our God-given identity. God replaces the labels we used to wear when we take on his name. Shame doesn't have a place on me anymore. It can't stick. Why? Because I'm open about where I've been. I was a sinner. I was an orphan until he put his name on me. I was full of the flesh, anger issues. Maybe I had a hard time doing this or doing that until he put his name on me. Shame no longer has a place. The devil no longer has a foothold in my life when I put his name on me. Why? Because the name of God repels the darkness. There's no place when you allow God to raise up for himself a king in you. <laughs> I've provided for myself, God said. And I've placed a king on the center of you. How do we know? Because the Bible says that I have placed this treasure in earthen vessels. There's a treasure in you. And every time you disagree with the will of God on your life, you're disagreeing with the treasure God has planted on the heart and the inside of you. Walk with confidence. And don't entertain those who are supposed to be the entertainment. The stage has been set for the king. That the light may shine and the darkness will comprehend it not. The kingdom of God is within me. When we wrestle with our identity we, identity, we wrestle with a snare. The Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. The fear of man, that means the respect of man. I care about what you think of me. I care about whether you think I'm nice or whether you think I'm doing a good job. It's a snare. And you know, a snare isn't, can't, isn't meant to kill you. It's meant to keep you still. Oh, as long as you care about what the entertainment thinks about you, as long as you care about the applause of people, it's going to keep you frozen in time. God says, get set free from the labels and you'll get set free from the snare so that you can walk with purpose and confidence and allow my kingdom to come upon the earth and do what it's called to do. True freedom, true freedom is being free from the snare of man, being free from the snare of the expectations of our family members, of what they think we ought to be doing, of what they think our healing looks like. Oh, you're spending way too much time at that church. I'm set free from that snare. Hallelujah. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on the earth, in the valley, not just in Legacy Church, but outside the doors of Legacy Church. The kingdom of God is on the move, y'all. When you step into, walk into, walk with purpose with your God-given identity, I pray that you don't drop a morsel of this truth today. That when you step into or even step into the temptation to say, wait, why would I think that I belong here with all these free people 
at Legacy Church. Look at them. They're so free. The way they raise their hands and they don't know what I've been through. They don't know what I've done. They don't know the sins that I've committed. They don't know the mistakes that I've made. And they're, they, they're able to raise their hands because they ain't as bad as I've been. Oh, no. That's a snare. That's the snare of the past. But when you become free, when you become truly free, you allow the know that the Lord is a changing your name. He says, I'll take that label of shame. I'll take that label of, of slut or whore, or whatever it is that they called you before, a wreck, a orphan, poor, despised, I'll take it. And God says, you take my name. And now the atmosphere, it begins to change when you walk in. Let's stand to our feet. This is what I want to do. If there's anybody here today that said, you know what? Now's the time. I'm ready to let go of what was and take hold of what's now. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've been struggling with some things of expectations and wrestling with what you're supposed to be doing because other people did it and that's what you feel like you're supposed to do but you're really feeling like the Lord is calling you in a different direction or you're really feeling like I'm done I'm tired of wrestling with with shame I've been having a hard time shaking it off the thoughts of my past the mistakes of my past I don't know who you are today but look the Lord wants to meet with you today and he's saying look I got room to take your label if you got room to take mine if you enjoyed today's incredible message, make sure you share with a friend and give us a thumbs up. Here at Legacy Church, prayer is our priority. So let us know how we can be praying for you by emailing prayer at legacyaz.church. If you'd like to partner with Legacy, you can donate any dollar amount to the number 84321 or download the church app. You can also go to our website, legacyaz.church and click on ways to give. You'll see links to support Legacy Church. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment below and go out and love, live, lead like Jesus.